Thank you for tuning in to another episode on InRange. This is the third and final in a series on the Underground Railroad. And this is the conclusion for good reason, because I'm standing in front of the Levi and Catherine Coffin House, which was considered the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad. It's reported by Levi that over 2,000 refugee slaves passed through this house on their way to freedom. And as far as he knows, they all actually made it. Some of them to Canada, some of them to free black communities in the area. But this house is important, so stay tuned for about an hour from a docent about everything that happened here and why this is such a pertinent place. Welcome you to the home of Levi and Catherine Coffin. This is a 1839 federal style home that was built for the Coffins. And um, I just want to give a little background um, before we kind of get straight into the tour and kind of talk about expectations of what you're going to learn today. Um, Levi and Catherine Coffin were part of a group of anti-slavery Quakers here, specifically in this community, but in Wayne County that were involved in helping with what we call the Underground Railroad today. Um, this home historically was known as the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad, so had a pretty prominent place in this, in this movement. Um, Levi and Catherine came here in 1826 from Central North Carolina, specifically Guilford County, and they're part of what's known historically as the Quaker Migration. So we have um, somewhere estimated between 10 to 12,000 Quakers that are going to be coming out of the South, specifically here into Wayne County and Settle. And Newport, what Fountain City was historically known as, was um, a Quaker village um, primarily. And so the Coffins come here in 1826. Um, this was not the first house they lived in. So this is going to be the last home that they have. They will call Newport home until 1847. And uh, in that year, Levi and Catherine will make the decision to moved to Cincinnati, so towards the end of the tour, I'll kind of go into that story of what took them away. Um, it's a pretty simple home, and simple what I mean uh, for a Quaker, um, though he is doing very well him for himself as a businessman, um, as a Quaker, he doesn't believe in materialistic things, so we have presented the house as we believe it would have looked when Levi and the family lived here. Very short period of just over eight years. We're very lucky that the house has primarily almost all original detail throughout, so as a historic house, we even though there were parts that were restored, um, we didn't have to replace original detail for the most part. But unfortunately, we have nothing personal belonging to Levi and Catherine and their family um, in those years that they were here or ever in their life. We have a few objects related to his life as a businessman and to other family members that he, he knew, but nothing of them personally. So my tour doesn't really focus on objects. It focuses on stories and talking about the impacts that the coffins made in that 20 year period they were here. So. Feel free at any time to ask questions, um, if you want to have discussion and such. Um, we, I've kind of catered my tour around some of those five or six questions everybody has in their head at the beginning of the tour. So stick with me and I'll make sure most of those questions you may have have been answered. Okay, But feel free to interject at any time. So as we go room by room, I will focus on what each room we believe served as for the family. Um, I will point every so often to some objects, but for the most part, I'll be focusing on those stories, which mainly come from Levi's autobiography that he published in 1876. So I'm um, giving you kind of the tip of the iceberg of his story. If you are interested in more, it's called Reminiscences of Levi Kaufman. You can download it for free on Google Books. It's not hard. It's not a, not a hard read, but it is a long one. I'll warn you, it's over 700 pages. So, <laughs> so the room we're standing in is a room we call the library kind of a parlor space um, off the front door of the house. Um, when Levi decided to have this house built, um, he's been in this community now for 13 years. Um, as I mentioned, he's a businessman. When he first came here in 1826, he uh, started a dry goods business. And over that period, that will expand to investments in other businesses, including uh, the pork packing trade. I think he had a tannery which I was just reading about, linseed oil mill. Um, and so uh, he's now not just the dry goods store owner, but he's got his, um, his fingers in many projects here in town. So, um, but he builds this house after a 13 year period. So I'll talk a little more about the house a little later in the tour. Um, but this space, as we interpret it, we actually talk a little bit about why we specifically put beds here. Um, by this period, too, Levi's uh, reputation as an abolitionist is starting to grow. He talks in his book about abolitionists coming specifically to Indiana to make speeches and such with regards to the anti-slavery movement, which is growing in the United States. And because of his work um, with anti-slavery movement here in Indiana, that's attracting them to come and visit him here in Newport. He specifically names Frederick Douglass as being one who came to Newport, not just to speak, but we believe visited him here while he was in the house. 
We have a letter of Levi's that he wrote uh, when he was living in the house. I have a pretty bad copy of it over here. I should say a bad copy, but... Um, but not the original. The original is in Erlen, but it was discovered in the house when it was restored, and it specifically mentions a man named Arnold Buffum. Arnold Buffum will actually help to start an anti-slavery newspaper here called The Protectionist, and he and his wife are boarding, according to the letter, with Levi and his family. So Levi and Catherine live here with four of their children, and his mother as well is living, and we don't believe they would allow anyone who was a guest of their home to be upstairs with the family. They potentially would create a separate space for them. So that's why we've staged the beds here, because this is one of the few rooms uh, with its own door and such where they could get that privacy. So What year was that? 1841. Yeah. This is actually a reply letter to his son, Jesse, who's in Ohio at school. Mm -hmm. And Jesse wrote home asking dad for some money. Basically, it's one of those letters. Never he never changes. And um, so what's great is there's some details here that he doesn't mention in the book. So we, we were able mm -hmm. to glean some things this way. The desk that's here actually was an object that Levi sold at his Cincinnati dry goods store that he'll open uh, when he moves to Cincinnati. And uh, we're able to trace that because uh, the shipping label still exists on the back side, which is the side we don't display. So it was actually shipped to a man named Joseph Williams in Henry County. And it says care of Levi Coffin. So, so just giving you a taste of some of the things that he was known to procure and sell through his dry goods store. So the store that he owned here in town originally stood where our pizza parlor is here on the main cross streets where our blinking light is. And eventually we'll open a second location um, one block north of here. So, or of the first location out of the house. Oops, I was smacked you in the arm. Any questions I can help with? All right, we'll keep moving. So come on this way. So this is the front door of the house which is a door we right now don't take a lot of people through when they come to the house. And oftentimes when you visit a historic house, you go through the front door, but we actually don't use that front door for that purpose. And we do so because if you can imagine someone such as a freedom seeker or runaway slave, which is how I'll refer to them in my, in my tour, would not come to the front door of the most prominent house of the most prominent man in town. So we'll, we'll get back to that. So we, we normally don't take folks through the front door. This is a map of historic Newport, we think from around 1850. And even though Levi's moved away by this point, he still owns the house, so his name is still on the property. Levi always intended to move back. So he, though living full-time in Cincinnati at this point, expects that soon he may come back. That was his intention, was not to stay gone for too, too long. So what brought him to Indiana? So um, actually, I'm going to talk about that next. Okay. So see what I mean? I've got my tour all situated for those questions. But um, that's a really good question to ask. Like, what would draw people to Indiana? Um, Indiana became a state in 1816. And a big draw for Indiana, um, bringing people here, was land. We had a lot of it, and it was cheap. Now, Levi, though, is part of a growing number of Quakers who are leaving the South more because of their disagreement with the practice of slavery. So Levi is born in Guilford County, North Carolina, where he's raised. Um, and he is ra being raised in a church that does not support the membership participating in any way with the practice of slavery. So if you were a member of the Quaker church, you were not allowed to own a slave at this point. You could not even profit. So if you were willed slaves, you know, you weren't allowed to sell a profit from it. Um, and so many Quakers in North Carolina are advocating for the state to make it easier to allow enslaved people to become free, to allow them to live a free life there. Um, really, Levi is of the idea of complete emancipation across the board. Um, but the state of North Carolina won't really allow that to happen. Um, they're, they're not necessarily interested in that. So many Quakers decide to leave and come west, and Indiana was attractive for them, one, because of that opportunity of coming here and being able to settle and start a new life, but Levi says in his book he never believed he would see another enslaved person ever again by coming to a free state. So he thought he has come here and he will start a new life. US 27, which sits in front of the house, historically was a road known as the Quaker Trace. So as I mentioned, we have a good fair amount of Quakers coming in, and uh, all of these little Quaker communities are being established along, time, um, along it. And uh, Levi comes to Newport, his parents are already living here. So that's what's bringing him specifically here. Um, 
he starts his dry goods store and, and almost immediately he starts to notice that this road is being traveled by many people but that includes the freedom seekers themselves many of them crossing the ohio river if you were to follow the south today it takes you into cincinnati ohio um, and that's where it came from historically as well so many who are crossing the ohio river um, see a road as an opportunity to get them further north Levi feels very compelled to step in and help and to whether that's providing room and board, new clothing, food. Um, as a Quaker, he believes that that is his job. That is what he's been taught to do as a Quaker. But as a community, he says there's not really a lot of support for this in these early years to get involved. The idea of breaking the law to help a freedom seeker and a slave person in their escape just feels too dangerous at this point. Um, but Levi feels that it is worth the danger to get involved. Now, we also had a good number of free blacks living amongst the Quakers in this part of the state, and he does note that the free blacks were trying to do what they could, but um, as a businessman with his dry goods store and such, she felt he may be in a position that perhaps I can take things a little further. So he and his wife Catherine are really credited with kind of kicking off what becomes a more organized effort. It takes years to get that effort really working to where we have others in town. So this was not the only home. Pretty soon we have others who are willing to open their doors and help. Um, but for the, for the most part, Levi is really kind of credited with beginning that effort. So in those first few years, he says, my home was the only one that had a door that someone can come through and find safety and shelter and I would help them. And then a big part of that too was helping them get back on the road and get further north and to do that safely, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So this room we call the sitting room. Um, we very much see Levi and his wife Catherine as a team in this endeavor. Catherine was known for hosting other Quaker women here in town at the house, um, hosting what were known as the sewing circles. Um, so you can imagine if the coffins are supplying things like new clothing and such, that had to be made. You're not just going to the store and buying what's there. Levi could provide the cloth, the cloth, but somebody had to create it. And that's what the Quaker women were doing, and Catherine helped to coordinate that effort. Um, so we can imagine the women sitting here and, and, and the type of conversations they could be having as well. The portrait here is of a younger Levi on the back wall. Levi was a young man when he came here. He's just really started his family in this, which means if he was to be ever caught involved in this, he could potentially lose everything. His business, um, the fines of those days could be up to $500 with inflation, we're looking at $15,000 today. So um, there is history here in Wayne County of that happening and people literally being ruined because their per personal property never uh, equated to whatever the fines were. So Levi, though, understood the danger he was getting into. And the law they'd be breaking at this point in time would be the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act. Correct, that is correct. So. So he started, when did, when did they actually start? When did they... He makes it seem like not long after establishing his business and kind of getting his new life started here. Okay. So that's just kind of a in the statement. 40, he made, the 1826 is when he moved here, so okay. really, yeah, sooner than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and the first time we think they lived in possibly was an apartment attached to that dry goods store. Um, and so it's, and he does mention at times his store was used if, his house may not have been the safest. The store mm -hmm. was not too far away and could be used as another hiding place as well. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there are, uh, is there books that talk about the journey, journey itself from North Carolina to Indiana? Levi goes a little bit into it himself and his experience. He actually came to Indiana twice. He came a few years before. And then he brought his family. And then he came, there. yeah, because he actually goes all the way towards Illinois actually. Almost, he gets lost in Illinois, so he's pretty lucky he got back okay. Um, but uh, he talks a little bit about that journey, at least the directions, and um, the type of going through travel. Tennessee, yeah. Okay. He's coming by wagon. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, so there were some Quakers that once they got to Tennessee, they kind of stopped for a while and then lived there for a year or two and then came up into Indiana. So I specifically remember that from the book of his yeah. journey itself. Quakers, I told you about mm -hmm. my Moran New Garden yeah. meeting house yeah. in Guilford County. Okay. Ended up in Henry. Mm -hmm. So they had to take very, very, very similar very experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I arrived in 1815. And there's only so many roads. No. Through the those National mountains. Road was yeah. just being formed. Basically. Right. There's only a few routes available at that time. So 
So uh, check out his book I will. and kind of get, you'll probably get something similar to what your ancestors went through. Yeah. Okay, so. good, thanks. Yeah. All right, come on back here. So one of the mysteries about the coffin story, because even though he wrote this autobiography and he gave us a lot of detail, there are certain things he chose not to tell us about. Um, and he really never talks much about the house itself. There's always been a belief that the house was built specifically with this intention of the service that they're involved in. So I'm gonna go through that, but just remember that we're speaking purely through historical theory because without written documentation, nobody contemporary of the coffins that lived here have ever talked of this either. It's kind of hard. We may never be able to prove it honestly. Um, and one of the fun things that people love about the Underground Railroad is that really cool house that they hear the oral history about of the hiding places and such. So, But one of the mysteries of the house that we have is, one, why he chose to build the house right on this part of town. Um, he says by the time he's here in the house, the suspicion's really grown around him. He knows at times my actions are under surveillance. So he's trying to obviously be more, more careful probably what he's doing, um, but he decided to build his house literally smack dab in the middle of town on the busiest road. <laughs> so there's, there's that. But even how it is built, there are some unique places to it that are very unusual for these type of period homes in this part of the country. So the room we're standing in, we generally call the dining room. And it's fun when we have kids here because we like to explore the artifacts that we have displayed here. And we definitely have a stage sort of as if it's a cooking fireplace, so there would be a kitchen here. And that's not the unusual part, generally, um, for these type of houses. The kitchen would be in the back of the house. And sometimes if you had a nice enough house, you may have a second kitchen outside of what's called a summer kitchen. We have no evidence of an outside summer kitchen. But what we do have is a full basement downstairs that is basically the same size as this room here with its own fireplace. And that's where that stairway leads right here. Um, so we call this the dining room because we think most likely that's what took place here, eating. Um, and we think a lot of the cooking was done downstairs. Now we always explore that space last. Um, but this is the door that we think most likely freedom seekers when coming to the home would have approached, knocked, or someone leading them here, this is where they would have been brought to. So that's why we bring you through this door and not through the front door of the house. Um, with many of the stories we have of Levi's wife, Catherine, and what her role in this is, a lot of what she witnessed happened within these walls. She's already a mother. She's taking care of her children. So she already had a great responsibility. But she also felt a great responsibility for anybody that they were helping. So in the few days they may spend here, she's going to make sure that they're not just well fed and well clothed, that they're healthy. So oftentimes that meant playing doctor. So we have stories of injuries, frostbitten toes because they traveled with no shoes on and such. Catherine would make sure that they had enough time to convalesce before they were going further north of here. Mostly, most of them, I should say, going to Canada. Um, but can you imagine how you can be prepared not knowing when they're going to arrive? How many are going to be arriving? Are there children with them? You know, all of these things are kind of unknown to Levi and Catherine. Um, but regardless with the stories Levi gives us and, and others have told us of Catherine, she was never phased by this. So, um, but one of the things they remember the most is when someone or a group of people arrived, she would start cooking for them right away. So I'll come back to that here in a little bit when we go downstairs and explore the kitchen. Um, in one particular story, to kind of give you a sense of how many have been in this home at one time, Levi notes that many of them arrived under cover of darkness when it was safer to travel. They were coming here, arriving oftentimes by dawn. And in this story, there's a knock at the door, and that knock came from a man named William Beard. And he's one of the few people that Levi actually names first and last name with those he was associating with and helping with this. But when he arrives, he had two wagons outside the home, and Catherine sees him, not unusual that he's shown up, and she asks him, what do you have there? Um, William Beard's response is, I have all of Kentucky. So Catherine says, bring all of Kentucky in. So she knows that he has potentially, I think at this point, brought a group with him that are looking for shelter. 
but she cannot see them. Mr. Beard, uh, Levi Coffin, and several others who helped in the transportation from one place to another often used what was called a false bottom wagon. So it's a wagon with a false floor in it that created a cavity underneath where someone or a group of people could hide without being seen while traveling. So by the time the two wagons are unloaded, everyone's inside, Levi says, I, I did a head count, and 17 have just entered into the house. So talk about being ready, right? So now she's caring for 17 additional people. And the real big challenge is, too, making sure that nobody outside of this house knows that there's 17 more people here who should not be here. So that's another, uh, something that the coffins have to be on their toes about to, to make sure that nobody is suspicious enough that may cause a search of this house and such. So. Would they have been responsible for like having chickens and beef and sheep around so that they could have ready-made meals? Well, basically? you know, Levi's not a farmer. Mm -hmm. He's in business. Yeah. And with being in the dry goods store, he's got a lot of those kind of like fresh produce and stuff at their disposal. Um, Levi being in pork packing is raising hogs somewhere in town, L large amounts of hogs. Access so he's got access there. He does mention that sometimes they have to ask for the charity of others in town every so often if for some reason they just weren't in the right spot, um, either with his store or whatever, and, and whether it's asking for extra money or just donations of something that did happen as well. So um, that's about the easiest way I can answer based yeah. off what he tells us. So, um, but anyway, that's a good question to ask. I mean, it's a huge responsibility yeah, to I be mean. able to make sure you can feed them all. And he says many spend a couple days here, but there are some that are going to spend weeks or months, depending on the situation of what's happening. So that's even longer care um, there. So that's a big responsibility. At any given time, how many, how many people, because you mentioned 17, mm -hmm. like... Is there, is, was 17 the most? Or he believes there... it was, and at the time when he writes his book, which he's towards his end of years, he's a little mm -hmm. older, this is about 50 years later, he says that's the largest group I remember us helping at one time. Mm -hmm. But we have other stories of them helping, not quite as many, but close to. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't seem like something the coffins are not used to, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, but feeding 17 people, that's a lot. That's a lot of mouths to feed, you know? Yeah. And sometimes we don't know. Moment. Yeah. So sometimes we don't know if children are involved in that. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes he's specific about the group, sometimes he's not. Mm -hmm. So in, in trying to understand, you know, the coffins, it's important to remember, are not doing this by themselves. There are others within the community that would help. Um, one of the aspects that we're currently researching is trying to have a, a better sense of the free blacks that are living amongst them. Who can we identify that were involved in this? But Levi actually mentions, and we have history, of some runaway slaves who chose to stay here and live with the Quakers um, under identities of free people instead of going north. And one of those stories is a man named William Bush. Um, and so when I was discussing before about descendants still living here, his great-great-granddaughter still lives here in Wayne County, and she is one of my volunteers. <laughs> now, her perspective to this story is definitely a little different because she is speaking as a descendant of a runaway slave. And so it's, it's pretty special when you're able to get her tour, but she grew up in this town. So, um, but unfortunately, a lot of those descendants have moved on to other places in the county and stuff. But um, anyway, so to tell his story, a lot of what we know is oral history. She grew up listening to these stories that were handed down with objects that belonged to Mr. Bush. Now, his name, William Bush, was not his actual given name as, as a slave. It is the name that he either chose for himself while here, but the family where she was told Levi Coffin gave him that name. Um, and according to the family, the way he arrived here is he actually shipped himself in a box crate, very similar to Henry Box Brown, if you know that story, and it was addressed to Levi Coffin. Now, Levi doesn't mention that story specifically. I think he's not actually mentioned as a person, in, but we know that they knew each other. Um, so we're trying to research to see if we can confirm those details. But Mr. Bush made a life for himself here. He became the town blacksmith. He owned several different properties in town. He will marry. He will have children. He lived out the rest of his life here. And he's buried in our cemetery behind the park. And so if you go behind the you see the park, there's a bridge that takes you back. His is one of the first headstones that you'll see when you drive back there. 
So um, we know that there are others who were here um, that we're trying to learn a little more about too. Um, there was a gentleman whose name I cannot remember. He would always carry a rock in his right pocket for protection, just in case he was ever questioned about who he was. But Mr. Bush was taking a big chance because if he was ever asked for free papers, which in Indiana you had to as a free black have papers identifying you as such and he couldn't produce that, then that could potentially cause problems. Um, now next door in the interpretive center, if you get a chance, go next door, Mr. Bush's wooden shoes are on display. And those are one of the objects that were passed down through Eileen's family. And so um, it is believed he was wearing those shoes at the time of his escape, um, that he arrived in those shoes, which gives an indication that he possibly may have been trained as a blacksmith from where he had escaped from and to protect his feet in the forges. So, because that was obviously a skill that he had. Um, so there's a house, two houses north of here, which is where his blacksmith shop was located historically. So, yeah. Any questions with that? The mortal and pestle here also was handed down, um, was Mr. Bush's. He was also a veterinarian or kind of a, you know, had several skills. And uh, there were several, um, there was a cholera epidemic that went through town. He was noted of, he was had no fear of helping with the with the sick and the dead bodies, and so, pretty interesting story. So there are a lot of people in this county and the surrounding counties who probably don't realize how integrated these small communities were at one time, because uh, you don't see that evidence today so much. Um, but Eileen had said that when she had graduated high school, she was ready to get out of Fountain City. So, but she lives in Richmond, she's not too far away. Well, we'll go upstairs. Yeah, and this is where the fun part really goes. We're going to go upstairs in the back stairs. So this is our Garrett room, or the servant's girl room. We know or have evidence that Catherine had hired one or two young girls to act as a live-in servant for the family. The dress that's on the mannequin here was worn by one of those young ladies. Um, there are definitely stories Levi gives in his book where he sort of gives us details of how he would react at times when he was fearful of his house being searched. And uh, in one particular story, another large group of freedom seekers have arrived here, um, a group of 14. Um, they were led here by a freedom seeker named Jim who was familiar with the coffins on a previous escape and helped the 14 arrive here at the house. But before they made it into town, they were almost captured. So we know that this road was frequented by freedom seekers. Well, who's going to figure that out pretty quickly? The bounty hunters. Um, and uh, in this particular story, they were almost captured, but they were able to escape. Jim brings them here to the coffins. Once they arrive, they are brought inside, and Jim tells him what they have just experienced. So Levi gives a quote in his book where he just says, quote, I concealed them in my garret, end quote, until he could make sure that whatever threat was out there was not going to harm the 14. So that's all he says <laughs> in this particular story. And we believe that story happened during the years he's here in this house. So the room here, as I mentioned, you know, we call it the garret room. Um, in these type of houses, sometimes this roof line is so severe, it's not really big enough to sleep in or use as a bedroom. Um, so even if you can imagine 14 people being here, they would be comfortable, but we're talking about a space in the house that's pretty accessible to find if the house was searched. Now we don't believe historically the house or any house he lived in was searched. He never mentions in his book this ever happening. He definitely says there are threats to do so. People come to his front door and are threatening that they're going to do it, but None of them ever have evidence really to use against him. And legally in Indiana, if you had evidence, you had to procure a search warrant before you could even cross over the threshold. So regardless of, the, of that fact, we still have no evidence that tells us that the house was searched. So we don't believe it happened. And for this particular story, we actually think he's speaking about the space behind what would be this small door here. It is a closet that's 15 feet long. It goes the entire length of the room. It's only three feet wide inside and that ceiling goes and goes and goes until it meets that brick wall. Um, with the evidence that we have for that, I mean, beyond the fact that that space is kind of configured that way, um, Levi had a nephew who confirmed that story. Um, in particular, when he came back as an older man 
and was walking through the house telling memories and stories. So um, he specifically points at the door and says that is where Levi hid the 14. He actually goes further to say that what Levi would do is once they were inside and the door was shut, a piece of furniture would be moved in front of it to conceal the door. So if the house was searched, the hope I'm sure being, they would not realize that there is a, a hidden door. Now Levi says they were only there long enough until he can confirm there was no threat. So we don't have an actual idea of how long that is. Are we talking hours? Are we talking days? It's difficult to say. Um, but, uh, and he says they were here in the spring months. And in Indiana, we, the first week of April, we were still having snow. And by the end of May, we had a really hot day like today. So it's hard to say what kind of spring day did they experience. But to give you an idea for some who had to spend longer here, he does tell another story of two young girls, two sisters, who actually made it further north of here and had to turn around and backtrack. Um, when they arrive, Levi says Catherine hides them between the mattresses of one of the beds in the house. Whoever's looking for them is not too far behind. So it's believed that he may try to search houses. He says she gives them enough room to breathe between the mattresses and tells the girls to remain quiet and to stay there until um, there is no threat anymore, until it's safe. But unfortunately, Catherine is having issues with getting the girls to calm down or at least to be quiet. So the word Levi uses in the book is overexcited, which might mean are they tickling each other? Are they laughing? What are they doing? We don't know, but they're making noise, which can't happen. So she ends up having to split them up and put them in two different beds until they could confirm that they were safe. The man who was looking for them was actually the man who owned them as property, which is really rare to see. Oftentimes they hired people to do the work for them. Um, but the girls ended up having to stay in the house for a two week period because he would not give up. He kept coming back to town every day trying to do searches. So he must have known how close he was to finding them in that instance. So um, those are a few of the stories that we think took place in the years that he's here in this house in particular, but there are more stories in his book. Obviously, I'm just giving you kind of the tip of the iceberg of the other experiences they had. Um, but he does mention that in the years he was in Indiana, he says, I never got word that anyone I helped was ever captured. So in his mind, whoever he helped was able to find freedom. Now, he really encouraged them to escape to Canada, to escape American laws. Um, he will go to Canada to visit with them um, to see how they were doing. He was very happy to see that they were doing very well for themselves there. Um, but there were others like Mr. Bush who chose to stay. A dangerous decision, but, but one that, um, that some did choose to do. So, any questions with this? Was... Is there a doc? I mean, obviously, in Mr. Bush's case, there was a documentation, mm -hmm. just word of mouth, of, of intentions of staying. Was his intentions to help with the Underground Railroad? We do have evidence that he has been part of this, yes. Yeah. Um, but again, it's one of those things where it's part of the family history. Mm -hmm. So um, there are no specific stories of Mr. Bush in, in his book, specifically with Levi. Mm -hmm. um, and not. I don't want to say there isn't, but there aren't too many others in this county that spoke of their experiences either. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of, this is like the unspoken history. If you're part of it, you don't really talk about it. Even after the Civil War, people didn't want to be seen as lawbreakers and troublemakers. They didn't want their reputations hurt. The coffins are more along the line of they see themselves as servants. It's not about celebrity and it's not really about us, you know, but mm -hmm. he will eventually write his book in hopes of providing an income for his wife in mm -hmm. case he passed away. So, um, so there's a lot of it is oral and that's the challenge of this too, because a lot of the documentation in the very early years it was studied is coming from like children whose parents were involved in this or people who just happened to live in the same village and, uh, you know, so it's, it's secondary evidence. Mm -hmm. It's not, that's what makes Levi's story so much more important is we are getting the first person perspective. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately he's going to die a year after his book is published. So if he has survived a few more years and someone chose to interview him and they might have asked some of these questions that we're still asking today, it's mm -hmm. possible we could have gotten an answer that we don't have. So, But I think Levi respected the fact that some people did not want to be identified. Mm -hmm. That's why he doesn't really name people. He gives like initials and in names. Watch your Herod right here. So this is our master bedroom for the house. We think Levi and, and Catherine's room when they were in the house and possibly sharing it with some of their children. That's why we present it with a trundle bed. We're sure at times, literally, the house is very crowded. Um, 
beyond the constant threat of bounty hunters, um, Levi does have another challenge, and that is within the church that he belongs to. Even though the, the Quaker church has an official stance against the practice of slavery, there's a lot of disagreement over how to end slavery and what should happen. And this is not just in the church. This is just in America in general. What are to happen to enslaved people once they become free? Um, and around 1842, 1843, we're going to start seeing kind of a split or a schism, really a disagreement amongst Quakers. Levi calls himself an anti-slavery Quaker. Uh, he believes in the outright emancipation and allowing them to live as free people here in the United States. But there's a growing consensus amongst other anti-slavery Quakers here in Wayne County that believe the church as a whole believes in this um, concept of what was called the colonization in those days. And um, there was the American Colonization Society. Our first governor in Indiana was a colonizationist, Jonathan Jennings. But this belief that um, once enslaved people become free, there should be an effort to have them sent to Africa. Now, an issue with that is the fact that by that point, most enslaved people are natural born Americans by this point. Um, they have no direct connection except through their ancestry with the continent of Africa. So there were issues there, and there was disagreements about that. Um, because the anti-slavery Quakers can't seem to come into agreement with that, that thought, there is going to be this break in the church. And so Levi and other anti-slavery Quakers will decide to leave the official church and help establish what becomes known as the anti-slavery meetings. So here, historically, in Newport, there were two Quaker ch churches. On the south we have was New Garden, where the Coffins had membership, and then we have the Newport meeting on the north side, uh, which still stands, and both buildings. And um, Levi and the anti-slavery Quakers will form their new church through the Newport meeting. However, since the Newport meeting is still officially part of the Quaker church, they're not allowed to be in the same room where those Quakers meet. So they build an additional room to it, and that's where they have their anti-slavery meetings. Um, the Quaker Church is upset with the anti-slavery Quakers as well because of their support of these anti-slavery societies, which are not sanctioned by the Quaker Church. So there's a lot of disagreement, like I said, on, on the best way to handle this situation. The schism is going to last till about 1856. So even after the Coffins move away to Cincinnati, um, there's still this tension with, uh, with the Quakers here in Indiana. And so here in Newport and other Quaker communities and other counties, they're going to see that as well. Um, with some of the other Quakers that we have knowledge of here in town, we know of a couple named Daniel and Emily Huff, whose house still stands here. Um, it is south of here on US 27. The linen suit on, in the closet hanging is Daniel's, and the dress on the mannequin was his wife Emily's. They were friends of Levi and Catherine, and like them, anti-slavery Quakers. Their home um, was first built by Emily's father and was a um, boarding house here in town. So in kind of understanding, you know, sometimes we get the questions of how did Levi get away with it? Well, I mentioned that nobody ever really presented, nobody spoke out against Levi. There were no eyewitnesses that ever spoke out about what he did. But sometimes Levi got tipped on people who may be hurtful to his cause. And um, the Nixons in the house, when they ran that boarding house, if a slave catcher checked in, guess who came and told them? Hey, somebody dangerous has arrived in town, whoever you're helping it may be time to get them out pretty quickly. And so they were instrumental in helping that, and it's believed, I think, at times their home, too, was used um, in that effort of helping to conceal enslaved people as well. So, any questions with that? Yeah. My goal is to develop a walking tour so that we can talk about some of these other stories outside the coffins as well and talk about a bigger history here in town. This is our stairway here that leads to the upstairs attic of the home. Um, although Levi doesn't say so specifically for this house, he does mention using a similar space in his Cincinnati home, he had two different houses, um, allowing freedom seekers to sleep upstairs during the day and then they could come down at night and have their meals and such. Um, so we have a hunch that it's possible he was doing that here too. Um, if you can imagine when you do have a good number, excuse me, of freedom seekers coming into the home, and they need some place to sleep. There's really no other place in the home large enough to be able to do that. So that covers the whole top, or sorry, above us um, of these two bedrooms. Um, 
unfortunately I can't take you up there for safety reasons. Um, but it's a pretty good size. And this is just the third bedroom of the home. Um, Levi's mother will move in with the family and she'll live here until she passes in 1845. So uh, Levi, I think, always considered Newport to be his home, even though he only lived here for 20 years. He did try to come back and live. But um, his parents are buried here. Three of his children are buried here, although we're not quite sure where because their gravestones are not very evident. We haven't found the records that, that tell us. Um, but one of the services we do here as a site, too, is we do a lot of genealogy. So people who have um, Quaker heritage um, that connects to this community or to the New Garden, North Carolina community where the coffins come from, oftentimes we can help. So um, we have people from all over the country who are descendants of the Coffin family. So one of the oldest um, objects we have in the house is this pewter bowl, uh, which came in 1642 with a man named Tristram Coffin. So anyone who's of Coffin descendancy can all trace their an ancestry back to this one person, Tristram. Um, so his house stands on Nantucket Island. That's where a lot of Quaker families got their start. Um, so uh, the Coffin family being one of them. So this bowl supposedly was brought to Indiana by, by Thule, who was Levi's uncle. And then the trunk here was a traveling trunk brought from North Carolina by a woman named Phoebe Coffin, who was uh, married to Levi's first cousin. So, unfortunately, just nothing personal, Levi and Catherine's just stuff that belonged to family and such. So we are in what we call the kitchen of the home. Um, here's our cooking fireplace here. And just kind of investigating what we can see visually, okay? Well, I'm gonna go back into historical theory mode at this point, okay? But when Levi chose to build this house, he identified, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna build a basement and we're gonna put a kitchen down there. He had a very deep basement dug for one thing. There's a lot of clearance, even the most tall guy that I have on a tour is still gonna have room for his head. Um, he had this original floor laid, brick floor as well. So he's gone to a lot of additional expense for this home. Did he do it for his wife? You know, um, that's the question that's in the air. It's very nice down here. It would be very comfortable to cook down here. And I very much believe that Levi loved Catherine. But I also very much believe that Levi and Catherine, like I said, they are servants. In their mind, they are serving in a cause that they think God needs them to serve as. And actors of so it is possible to assume <coughs> that Levi premeditated this because of what he's been doing he came here in 1826 he started his store got his family established and almost immediately starts getting involved in, in the Underground Railroad this is 13 years later isn't this a great opportunity to be able to build a home that helps to potentially allow the house to operate 24 7 for a lot of people and trying to dampen that suspicion. So that's the theory. But as I said, we may never find evidence of this. He's not hiding the fact that this space down here exists. This stairway existed. This isn't the original one, but it's rebuilt in the image of the original stairs. That window and this entrance for the cellar here are original as well. But we have no reflections from Levi in the book. Anybody who knew of the coffins and may have been familiar with the house also never spoke of this space. So, like I said, we may never find evidence. Now, Levi says at some point, I was keeping records of what I was doing, but we're not sure what was in those records because those have also disappeared. So it just may end up being the great mystery we can never solve. But it just seems too coincidental that he would do this and spend that kind of money because, again, they're sacrificing a lot already as it is. Now there's something else here, not particularly in this space, but in the root cellar that we think helps with this theory as well. So watch your step again right here. So when that first mystery I mentioned upstairs about why did Levi choose to build his home here in such a public space with what he was involved in, it is possible he chose because of what we have down here. We have a inside freshwater well or spring well. Now I will walk down to it and if you can't tell, it is still working today. Now in Levi's day, he would call this fountain well or fountain water. 
Um, the well itself is four feet deep. It is lined on the outside with bricks that are not grouted together, they're just stacked. And that allows the groundwater to come through the bricks and fill up the well, and it's actually escaping out the other side. This is overflow, just in case the well water gets too high. Now, this is just an awesome modern amenity to have in 1839 when the house is moved into, um, because now you never have to go outside for your water. It never freezes, so they had it year round. Um, and I can guarantee you there's no other house contemporary that has something like this. But again, we don't think they're concerned with their own comfort and their own needs. With trying to keep down suspicion of what they're doing and who they're helping and how many's here, a big indication would be how many times you had to go outside for your water. So if they had an outdoor well or if they used the creek that's behind the house, um, that's a lot of extra coming and going of water, which may cause questions. Here, you can do this 24 seven year round and nobody would know what you're doing. So we feel this just piles on. This is like the icing of the cake of this mystery in our minds of what is, what is happening. Now, another question we get from people is why are you no longer called Newport, Indiana? We don't even know where the name Newport came from because it's not like we're a port of anything here. Uh, so we can't explain that, but <clears throat> we know where Fountain City came from. As I said, Levi would call this a fountain well. This town, with the water table being so high, has a history of fountains just kind of springing up. And of course, we call them springs today. Um, in 1878, the town decided to change its name because there were two Newport Indianas. We have that problem in Indiana. There'll be a town established south, and then as the population moved north and west, somebody else wanted to have the same name. Well, in this Newport and a Newport straight west of here towards Illinois, the mail keeps getting screwed up. And so this Newport thought, okay, well, we'll change our name. And that's why they chose Fountain City. It's because of our very high water table. So basically the entire town is built on a big bowl of water. This house sits on a big bowl of water. Um, the fun things um, that were discovered in this house being the well itself, um, there used to be a concrete floor here. And this concrete floor at one time covered all of the historic brick all the way into the kitchen. And as a result, people living here in the 60s when the house was being restored had no knowledge that any of this existed. So this was the big reveal when that was removed because the goal was to bring the house back to 1839 condition and concrete wasn't available here as a building material and so that had to come up. So we have these ledges here on the wagon that would allow to set boards. And the boards would come about three quarters of the way. And then on top of the boards and on the very back, you would stack what you want people to think your wagon is full of. So what is the perfect cover, right, to be involved with this? Somebody who uses a wagon all the time. In dry goods, Levi's constantly seen with wagons, potentially making deliveries, picking up product to bring to a store to sell and such or had um, a wagon for that use, um, maybe not by him all the time specifically, but for his business. So we know that Levi had a wagon. He says his horses and wagon were at the ready 24 seven, because sometimes someone may have just arrived, I've got to keep them moving. So a big part of what Levi did was helping to coordinate the physical transportation and being involved in that as well. When he talks about where he takes them, he's normally taking them up to Randolph County, using the main road out of town, and uh, generally leaving them in communities that are identified as free black villages. So unfortunately, a lot of those homes um, in that history, you can't go up into Randolph County and see anymore. Um, but one area that you can visit, um, historically Levi calls it the Greenville Settlement, 
sat right on the Indiana Ohio line. Today it's known as Longtown because it's land that gets bought by a man named Long and then they named the town after him. Um, but uh, Randolph County had the largest free black population in the state of Indiana. So there are numbers um, living up there who are willing to help the Quakers out of Wayne County, helping them north into Randolph County and then helping to take them further north. Um, so the other communities he talks about are Snow Hill and Cabin Creek. But at Longtown, there stands um, partial one building of a school known as the Union Literary Institute that Levi talks about in his book. Um, there's a historical marker there now, um, but it's literally in the middle, middle of a field. Um, the Union Literary Institute was a school that was created to help educate um, blacks and whites. So like Eleutherian, okay, only they are co-racial. Um, and of some of the freedom seekers Levi helps, he decides they're of a good constitution, kind of some of the words he uses, uh, but of a good mind, very smart, that he takes them to ULI where they can get a free education. You could get college level classes there. As long as you were willing to work, like f I think it was a minimum of like four hours a day, they were working the land, you got free board and free, free room and board and education. So there, the school building for the ULI still stands. There's a group trying to preserve that building. There's a historical marker there. But that's not more than a 20 minute drive from here. So, um, so there are a few places that are still connected to those free black communities that existed. But that's primarily where the next stop went to for, for those who Levi was helping. And excuse me, if it was too dangerous to go north, he says Ohio wasn't too far away. He could send them east into Ohio as well. So. So just to kind of wrap up the tour uh, with my stories, when Levi chose to move to Cincinnati in 1847, it wasn't a very easy decision for him. Um, he built this beautiful home. He was going to spend his life in that home. He was very happy with his life here. But something he gets involved in is something known as the free labor movement. Um, very similar to our fair trade today, but there's this growing support within the Quaker communities in the Midwest not to economically support slavery. So Levi, as a merchant here in town, decides I no longer want to sell any product that has been touched by slave labor. So in 1844, he converts his store and starts advertising that it's a free labor store, which means if you buy cotton for him, from him, excuse me, then that is cotton that has been raised and processed by paid labor, which is very hard to source in the country at that time. But he. He gets it going. It doesn't really make a profit for him, but he doesn't mind that. He feels like he's making a statement. This is more important. In 1846, in Union County, Indiana, there's a free labor convention. Levi attends it, of course, um, because of his store. And at that convention, one of the hot topics they're discussing is the fact that there's very low supply for this. It's really hard to source things like free labor cotton and such, but there's such a big demand for it. So there's definitely a market to do this, but how do we get this supply up? And it was decided um, in that convention that a warehouse should be opened in Cincinnati. And the warehouse will work to bring up that supply to be able to source to the small dry goods stores and such like Levi's. And, but somebody's got to do this. And there was a vote, and it was voted that Levi Coffin would be the perfect person to do this, which, of course, he says, no, nope, not me. I am not really interested in leaving. They work on him for a year. They promise him uh, an investment of $3,000, and they say, you know what, just do it for a short period or something like that, which is actually what eventually gets Levi to decide to go because he says, okay, well, I'll do it for five years or up to five years and then I'll pass it on to somebody and I'll come back. So when he moves in April of 1847 with Catherine to Cincinnati, they still own the house because they think they're coming back. He gets the warehouse going. Things are going okay for the first few years, but again, he's having the same issues. Even for the warehouse, it's really hard to get a supply going and to make a profit. But Regardless of the fact that he could never make that work successfully, and after 10 years he sells that business, he still never moves back, ever. And that's because in those years he'll get involved in the Underground Railroad in Cincinnati. So Levi and Catherine decide to stay there and assist with those efforts. So one of the bigger mysteries, too, that we're studying is what is happening in the house while the coffins are gone? Because is it still being used as a safe house? We know that Levi's... Alfred's did not end because he left. Somebody is keeping things going because he mentions that many of the people he's helped out of Cincinnati, this is where he's sending them to. 
is through routes that take them through Newport. So we know he's renting the house out, we just, we're not quite sure to who, so we're trying to find out those details and can we confirm if the house is still considered a safe place being used for the Underground Railroad in those years while the coffins are away. So, um, so unfortunately when you go to Cincinnati all you can see of their lives are their gravestones because they didn't preserve the warehouse or the houses he lived in there. So, Is that because because of their religious beliefs or why it didn't get preserved? Yeah. I can't speak to why. Yeah. Um, but kind of in a period when cities were really starting to, to grow after the post-World War, that really wasn't, preservation wasn't on people's minds. Yeah. So um, his warehouse and first house that he lived in in downtown Cincinnati, there's a parking garage there now. I mean, so, um, and with that house that was outside of town, I'm not quite sure what happened, but to my knowledge, it's not standing anymore. So. So in regards to the free labor movement, mm -hmm. I would think that not only sourcing free labor produced cotton or products to make products would be more expensive. Yes. Meaning that the resulting product would be more expensive to sell. Correct. There are people willing to pay a premium for that when they could buy he, the cheaper slave labor content? You know, he when he transitioned his store and he starts to advertise, he says, I definitely got rebuked from people who said, I'm not paying those prices and I'm never shopping there anymore. They also felt he was making a political statement and they didn't feel that that was the right thing to do. So they left as customers. But he says, I got those customers replaced with the people who were willing to pay those prices because consciously they felt better knowing of what they were purchasing. So he curated his own customers and the, there were oh, customers willing, he just had to yes, get the right ones. Correct. One other question, which is a little bit more difficult one. Um, the, the coffins are very well profiled historically. I mean, these are yeah. considered, in Indiana, you look at the website, it's all over the place. Right. Uh, 2,000 something plus people potentially rescued or Correct. helped because of them. And that's his estimation. I spoke yep. about this earlier, like Elijah Anderson, uh -huh. 1800. Right. Doesn't seem to get as much of an attention. Do you think there's a reason for that or why? Well, again, this comes down to how the history is being recorded and who feels empowered to give that history. Okay. So a lot of Underground Railroad history right now, a lot of the research is going towards giving light to the stories of those who didn't feel they had the right or the power to be able to do that. So that includes women. Mm -hmm. Okay. Women are a huge part of this too. Um, and, but that also goes for, for blacks, whether free or slave. Um, when you think of society, even post-Civil War, despite things changing with the ending of slavery in the 13th Amendment, and then you have the 14th and 15th giving the rights to vote and being American citizens, there are still places in this country where, you know, you don't feel safe talking about those things, and even in the North. So um, when the history is starting to be collected, um, there's one gentleman out of Ohio State University who I look at his research a lot because it's one of the first here in the Midwest kind of collecting stories. Again, it's, it's oral stuff, but I don't know how much he's actually reaching out to the black communities of the Midwest as well as the white communities and such. So it's, it's, but as I mentioned too at the beginning of my tour, a lot of people didn't feel it was safe to even talk about mm -hmm. after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine being a black person mm -hmm. <laughs> too, for them, that, that was much, and obviously the reaction oftentimes to people involved, black, violence was more um, usual. And then you see Levi's story and somebody who practically had a community around him protecting. Now, I, I heartily believe that if William Bush was under a threat, Levi's going to do his best to protect him, but he's never going to use violence to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, his, his take is much different. It makes sense. So there were people that were in a situation in which they could speak to their history right. more safely. Right. And people like Elijah or others really couldn't. Correct. So as a result, the oral history may have been lost or not totally, but more neglected. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully you enjoyed this nearly long, if not hour long episode as a conclusion about the Underground Railroad on InRange TV. If you haven't watched episodes one and two, I'm going to urge you again to do so because what I'm going to talk about now is relevant to both of those. We asked the docent at the end of this tour today, why is it that Elijah Anderson, a free black man that helped rescue over 1,800 refugee slaves on the Underground Railroad, really doesn't have a lot of information about him, nor a museum. But behind us, we see Levi and Catherine Coffin's house as a full-on docent-led museum, and they rescued or helped rescue approximately 2,000. The number is about the same. However, the equivalency in terms of historical data that we have now is not. And it's actually a very interesting uh, answer that came to us. Levi and Catherine Coffin had an entire Quaker 
family and friendship around them that protected them and insulated them from what came after the Civil War. And so this was not necessarily an oral history behind us. In fact, Levi was willing to write a book reminiscing about his days on the Underground Railroad. The free blacks, such as Elijah Anderson, while well, he did not survive, but others did, couldn't. It became an oral history throughout their family because they would still have been treated as criminals for their act on the Underground Railroad even past the end of the Civil War and theoretically the end of slavery. So as a result, the history of the free blacks that helped on the Underground Railroad is diminished while the history of Levi and Catherine Coffin and others of their type is a bit escalated because we have the data and we can actually have information from them because they were not afraid to speak about their experiences during the Civil War, before the Civil War, but most importantly, afterwards. Guys, if you haven't watched episodes one and two, again, please do so. This is the kind of stuff that will not be funded by monetization on YouTube, it just isn't. We are supported entirely by Patreon from viewers like you. If you can, consider supporting us on Patreon. Please think about it. If you can't, please subscribe to our channel. Find us on all of our distribution networks on inrange.tv. But most importantly, thank you for watching and share with your friends.